Welcome back to Season 5 of the True Blue Conversations podcast with your host, Adam Bloom. G'day, podcasters. Before we get underway with True Blue Conversations, just wanted to give a huge shout-out to our friend and sponsor, the Warrior U Podcast, hosted by Bram Connolly. Bram is a former Special Forces commander, best-selling author, popular podcast host, and human optimization pioneer. He has an authentic style and the unique ability to not only motivate, but also take people on a journey of self-discovery. Through the Warrior U podcast, Bram interviews guests in a bid to explore all things human optimization, resilience, leadership, and coffee. His book, The Commando Way, A Special Forces Commander's Lessons for Life, Leadership and Success, is available now on amazon.com.au. So from Adam Bloom and all of us here at True Blue Conversations, a big shout out to the Warrior U podcast, Bram Connolly and his new book, The Commando Way, out now. Ah, Welcome back after that short little break. So that happens, mate. End of 2014, you're back at the regiment. What, what's happening next? Uh, uncertain. Better get my microphone first. <laughs> uh, uncertainty uh, of, you know, like I, th- I honestly thought I was um, going to be kicked out of the military. And, and to be honest, to be fair, with being charged for something like that, that's what you expect to happen. Um, but, you know, I was wronged and he didn't pull the trigger. He pulled the trigger on the allegations, but he didn't pull the trigger on the exiting of defence. Um, saving grace, sure. Uh, I get back to the regiment. Um, it's quite funny because my RSM was the clerk of the court because you've got to have representation from a regiment. And he's obviously heard the whole thing and he, mu- he must have gone back and said, hey, he's been wronged here and this is what's happened. But he did or he didn't. I get back and the RSM at the time pulls me in and goes, um, because I'd been in administrative limbo for so long, he goes, well, the only job I have for you to offer you now that we know that this is the outcome is uh, Op Sergeant Tag East. So I, he go, so he's offering me a senior role as the Tactical Assault Group East Counterterrorism Operations Sergeant. And that's just trying to put it into perspective of the listeners out there that, okay. And I'm just looking at him and I'm going, wow. I'm like, that's a massive job. That's a non, no fail job for a guy typically that has already done all of his section commander time, his platoon commander time, uh, so his platoon sergeant time, and he is now going into tactical operations. And he's like, well, that's the only job I've got for you. That's the only role I have. And I didn't care that it was a sergeant role. That, apparently that was it. And I'm like, so I, I took some time and I'm like, right, eh? let's, let's do this. And not only taking time to accept that that's what the role was to, to be, that was a really defining moment in me changing lanes emotionally and professionally to a role where I couldn't be around the boys at all and my role was now political in the fact that I am administrative um, accountability you know up and out uh, dealing with stakeholders dealing with assets time management um, yeah it was it was yeah intense and then getting back from that I had to then link in with the current operation sergeant of tag east and and um go and watch him do i think the g20 i watched the g20 i went up as an observer um to get some insight into the roles responsibilities how it goes around what who you're dealing with what you're dealing with um in hindsight it's probably the best thing that ever happened to me um professionally uh you, you know you go from kicking doors and, and being so staunch and very proficient at the um, the one percenters that um, to grow as a professional you need to change lanes and you need to be able to facilitate uh, politically and talk differently and get now dealing with civilian organisations that facilitate 
you know, like Qantas and other big organisations that, you know, we work and, and deal with as stakeholders. So it's like, it's massive. And then you've got external um, military organisations um, and that provide different assets, you know. So you're not now not just dealing with um, alpha males that are cool dudes that want to kick doors and be fit and push pig and, you know, like it's really changing lane. So that was what I ended up doing. And, you know, after I went up and watched the uh, G20 and, and then uh, when I sat down at the desk for the very first time, um, I set myself a couple of rules and that was the only people that are allowed to talk to me are one ones or uh, planners. So three ones, one ones and platoon sergeants. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't have any of the boys coming into my office to see how I'm doing. I wouldn't go and see them. It was just really focused on the job. And it's quite funny, the very first day that I sat down at the job was the Link Cafe. Let's talk about that. <laughs> yeah, let's. Yeah. Um, yeah, so first day, get a call out. I'm like, okay, we're going to do a call out drill, no dramas. I get to the office and it's like, I'm, and I'm always super early. And I'm expecting it. So, no, I was like, you know. And then, you know, like, everyone's running around. I'm like, oh, yeah, this is, you know, I've got to go and organise certain things. And it was like, hey, this is no duff. This is this is real. I'm like, what do you mean? It's like, yeah, Link Cafe, we've had this, 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 and this happen. I'm like, wow. So it was, it was full on. Uh, it was me lucky that I've already done a handover. So I'd already been through the processes. I knew who to call, how to call. Um, you'd already really been on the job. Um, literally now it's just my signature on those calls. So, you know, uh, as the administrator and the operations sergeant, uh, I had certain roles, stakeholders, uh, organisations to link in with, uh, meeting critical times, critical intents. It was a no-fail mission within the realms of uh, counterterrorism. Uh, in, in saying that, obviously there's processes uh, that need to be adhered to from uh, government agencies and um, handover procedures that need to be uh, author authorised by even up to the Prime Minister on who has the lead. So obviously how I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of the, the Link Cafe and, you know, who should have, how it should have happened, you know, who had the lead, whatever. Um, you know, it happened how it happened and... It's probably good that it happened the way it did because we got to sort out a lot of um, discrepancies between the processes real time, not just this is how it should happen and this is how it would happen on the day. And just because you train that certain way doesn't mean that that's how it's going to happen on mm. the day. So, you know, yes, there was one individual who um, was claiming to be a terrorist with a bomb in his bag uh, and the police had it. Um, but there was a lot of factors that, you know, okay, they haven't dealt with. So typically when the tactical assault groups go in, they have the shock of capture. Well, now they don't have the shock of capture and their planning processes and everything else, you know, it is what it is and it happened how it happened. And, um, you know, there was a lot of lessons learnt from the Link Cafe and, you know, live and learn really. Mm. As, as professional organisations, um, let's just say we learn a lot. So leave it at that. Yeah, probably, probably best to leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so then, 2016, what's happening? What's happening here? Uh, so yeah, um, counterterrorism. All of 2015, 2016, uh, I rotate into Delta. It's still in Delta. Sorry. Then rotate out to um, Operation Sergeant. Still within the capacity of a. Uh, a different um, requirement, let's just say that. And then, uh, lucky enough, partway through that year, I went over to Iraq as part of the training team as a senior trainer of the um, Tustu uh, Iraqi Special Forces and worked within them building their capacity as a special forces organisation. So the whole regiment literally went through a, uh, a couple of programs whilst we were there and they just rotated platoons through because you could only do certain numbers mm. at a certain time. So is that, 
had a rock kicked off again at that point? A rock was always still going, but we were there in a. It's funny. I did the invasion in '03, and in 2016, I'm there training their special forces. Yeah, right. So, like, it's just this is how the world goes around, you know. But uh, I had within that team, I was the lead trainer, but I had um, Belgian special forces. I had one of their lieutenants and one of their sergeants, really good dudes, very knowledgeable. Actually, I had two of their uh, sergeants, uh, and they were uh, amazing. And then I had um, uh, two Dutch guys and then uh, a couple of other guys that, they came and went, but I can't remember what country they were from. Not not Dutch, um, not Belgian, um, Norwegian. Yeah, a couple of Norwegians, yeah. Or, or the Norwegians might have stayed and then the Dutch went. I can't remember. So that, how long was that deployment for? That was six months, yeah, right. give or take. Yeah, yeah. And then you come back and then you go back again. Okay, so yeah, in 2016 and 17... I spent 13 months either in Iraq or Afghanistan. So in 2016, I went over as a lead trainer. Uh, and then 2017, I went over as a, a replacement for the guys that needed to take. So they, they were there for seven months. So they get rockle, mm. which means they can go home and spend time with their family. And they get So I was there for eight weeks uh, as the uh, operations uh, role. Uh, and then, so I was accountable to the uh, regiment sergeant major over there, who's the theatre. So task force 66 or 63, or, or I can't even remember what the six, yeah, something like that, task force. Anyway, so, um, and then from there, I came back to Australia and then I went back over as the uh, PSD, so personal security detachment to the prime minister. I went over as part of that team as the executive officer. Uh, so I would deal with stakeholders, um, dignitaries, uh, and uh, manage any administrative uh, requirements with the the commander. Uh, we would work, and then he would go and do his things, and I'd go. But uh, you know, I, and then you know, it's quite funny. I went over in 2016 for two two PSDs, a uh, 2017, sorry, two PSDs. One being um, the Prime Minister Turnbull. And then uh, another one, which I ended up getting um, severe pink eye, mm. and I had to get Kazavac to Kandahar Hospital and get uh, like a minor eye surgery done, which was, uh, I had a full flush of like, almost like pepper spray again, where they flush out your eye. And I, yeah, I was stuck in Kandahar uh, as a Kazavac. So I got Kazavac so, um, from a PSD. So the boys isolated me, and I'm like, wait, I but to be. You know, to be fair, they have a job to do and the principal being the um, person we're securing needs to have a fighting force to travel and do the jobs that they need to do. So they just isolated me, treated me like a leper. And I'm like, yeah, sweet boys, all right. <laughs> like, I'm, I felt like a, like shit, <laughs> literally. And mm. it was because, yeah, like that, it was, what, you had some dust or something come in? I uh, probably had feces because, you know, Iraqis and that, they just shit in the street. Mm. You know, like, it, 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 everyone goes, oh, that's just disgusting. But that's just, like, that's the way toilets aren't, you know, uh, they're a luxury in the Western society. You know, TVs and that, yeah, sure. But they just live a certain way. Mm. And, and that's just their culture. But 2016, I'll, I'll go back, um, I started feeling a bit off uh, and... I didn't know what the feeling was and it lasted two weeks and it was in my stomach. So this is when I'm there as, a, as an instructor the first time. And I'm like, why, why, why am I feeling like this? And then it went away and then it came back for about a month. And I'm like, what is going on? So I started doing some research into brain trauma and head injuries. And about anywhere from eight, six to ten, eight years or something like that, which was, say, so what, 2009 I had it and then 2016. So what's that, seven, eight years um, post head trauma, I started getting what they call is clinical depression. So the toxins in my brain, um, were not like uneven or, un, you know, they weren't leveled. So I was starting to get what they call clinical depression from the toxins in my brain changing. Mm. So I was noticing that. And then in 2017, when I went back over there, uh, I, 
you know, I still went back over and I, you know, cause I still wanted to do the job. You know, my wife rang me and she goes, I can't do this anymore. You know, sometimes they, they say things that they don't mean. Um, but in my, like, I just listened to her voice and I knew that she meant it. And it's hard because three kids at this stage, you know, and I'm gallivanting around the world doing what? You know what I mean? Like, really? Get three course meals a day. I don't have kids or bills or anything else to worry about. So, you know, I, I'm like, okay, right, I'm done. Uh, but whilst over there, it, I was to be promoted and posted to the infantry school um, as an instructor in some capacity. I wanted to actually go to uh, depot company as a platoon sergeant mm. and deal with the men at their, and the soldiers, sorry, not just men, women now, uh, in their infancy of their soldiering growth. Mm. Uh, whether or not that would have happened because they typically send the um, special forces instructors to like the shooting school or something like that. So, But anyway, that 2017 was much the same. Uh, I was starting to change mentally. Uh, I was starting to fatigue a little bit more. Uh, I was doing things that I just wasn't uh, used to doing and I, I was aware that I was doing it. I'm like, wow. You know, I was dropping a magazine out of my weapon and I'm like, fuck. Like, something similar, like very small. Mm. But it was just little things that were starting to happen. You know, and I went to my mate who was the sergeant at the time, which is quite funny because he was one of my diggers at the time. And then, you know, being so long in the one rank, people obviously succeed you. Mm. And, uh, you know, like I asked him, how am I changing? What am I doing? And I was becoming a bit of a pest to him, really. And I could see it in his face. I'm like, Craig, just shut the fuck up. Mm. Like, pardon my French, you know, like just, and I was starting to second guess myself, which I'd never done before. And then, you know, 2018 was coming around and I, you know, and I'd already been struck for posting. So I get back in 2017 and I go and get more brain scans and do more brain tests. And, um, I really get into, okay, I need to find, you know, self-help's the best help, mm. uh, be proactive in everything when it comes to that. So, and then I knew that my posting had been struck. And then once the reporter come back and the doctor goes, hey, look, you've got severe, uh, what do they call it? Moderate to severe TBI and your reports state CTE, um, which means that your frontal lobe um, or atrophy of the brain has shrunken. So I could see in my MRI scans that my brain had shrunken and then you know, out of all my other injuries, that was the one that was going to get me out of the army. Uh, and he goes, look, you're going to have to be downgraded and we're going to have to. So I went straight to my doctor at Holsworthy and I said, look, this is what's happened. This is the report. And he goes, mate, you're going to have to be downgraded. And then um, he goes, I said, look, I'm meant to be promoted. And he goes, well, do you want to talk to the RSM first? And I said, nah, just do it. Because I knew that if my posting had been struck, regardless of me being um, promoted, I would have been posted to Singleton, mm. but not functioning in any capacity. So I would have been out of pocket, even though I would have been promoted. I wouldn't have had a role. I would have been away from my network of people that actually knew me and cared about me, which is the regiment and my family. Mm. And I, I, who knows where I would have ended up. So I, I, I got downgraded and rang the RSM as soon as I got downgraded and let him know that I'd been downgraded. And he was like, why didn't you tell me I would have promoted you? So then I said to him exactly what I just said to you then. And he just, okay, right. Cause he's, you know, he, he like, I, I didn't. And so what had happened is, um, I had to have shoulder surgery anyway. Like I was starting to fall apart mm. after, you know, 19 years or yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. So I had double shoulder surgery, 2019. I was, uh, med downgraded. I went through and did all my DVA stuff that I needed to do. So I went through the process and the, the luxury again of being around the people that know you, i.e. the regiment, I still gave them everything and any, any, any and all opportunities for mentoring. Um, I got tasked to do, you know, even on a Friday at, at the tag, the counterterrorism compound, I was cooking barbecues for the boys. Mm. You know what I mean? Like it's just those little things, you know, regardless of something that's, you know, it's just, where the boys can have a beer and they've, they've cleaned all their weapons and I've cooked them, uh, you know, and they can have a bit of downtime and, and have a bit of a laugh and they do like their weekly awards and who was the biggest dick or, you know what I mean? Like yeah, it just, yeah, yeah just... Just that, little things. Yeah. yeah. So I, I got to do that and then 
you know, I uh, went had all my surgeries in 2019. So. I just want to go back to two things in 2018 where you come back and you went under, you did some that, you you did the dead, like you went back. Oh, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and yeah, your yeah, sorry, got yeah. really crook. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, two things. Yeah, wow, two big things. So, uh, again, I was right into the um, self-help. So I um, got the opportunity to do what they called a restore trial. So it was a trial, but what it was, um, was in the middle of Sydney, in the city. And what it was is, is I didn't actually know anything about it. So I just went in there and it was a three day intense psychological test or examination where they would take you you would take talk about oh, what they what they say to me when I first got in there. They said, "Oh, um, what's your PSD moment?" And I said, "What do you mean? What PSD moment?" She goes, "You don't have a PSD." I said, "No, I got hundreds." She goes, "Well," she laughed, looked at me, and I said, "Well, we only need one." I said, "Oh, righto." So I you know sat there and deliberated, said which one would have most effect just on me alone. So I picked the dead man's click where I you know old mate fired the RPG and it, you know didn't go off sort of thing. Anyway, so what they do is they go in and they talk about the event and then they rewind the event in your head. Now go back, what happened, what do you do, what do you see, go back, what do you see. So for eight hours a day, for three days, I am... You're back in country. I'm in this gunfight and I am in it. Like, so let's talk about this gunfight. What happens? I took these paces, so go back. Oh, let's go back. So what do you see now? I see, And you just, you just, like, it's just becoming so real. Mm. Uh, and at the end of the first day, um, I remember, like, oh, yeah, yeah what, oh, we'll see you tomorrow. Oh, yeah, cool, no drums. Like, there was no, like, um, I should have been isolated. Uh, and I didn't know that until I went outside. So as I get in the elevator and go downstairs, I'm like, yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm like, yeah, okay, I've just been on the job. And I'm super alert, super you know, vigilant. I'm like, yeah, yeah. I get outside and I can smell absolutely everything. The perfume. Now, you've got to remember, there's no women wearing perfume in high hills in Afghanistan and, you know, with their blouses half done up and the mini skirts. So I walk out into the street in the middle of Sydney, the coffee smell, the laughing, the giggling, like, you're just super aware and I'm just, the, the smell of, wind, like, I just like, oh, I'm just like, I'm just a beast. I'm like, oh, wow. And I'm, I'm conscious. I'm like, fuck, man, you need to be careful here. Because I could just jump and just go, yeah, let's have sex. Let's, like, just yeah, nuts. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. you're just like, oh, I'm, you're that, like, you're alpha, that, you're that alert. alpha male. Like, yep. yeah, fuck, I'm ready to go. Anyway, so I had to walk all the way back to my car, which was at Vic Barracks. And I'm like, just fucking keep walking. One foot in front of the other. And it was just like, that was a, a test within itself. And it was just intense. I calmed down by the time I got home. Mm. I didn't talk about it. And I went back the next day and then they literally put you under again and you go in there and you talk about the whole fucking scenario, pardon my French. And then, yeah, the second day, not so much. I was, I was very aware. Mm. And I either I was still conscious of not being or being in country and then it just didn't affect me. But, mm. yeah, that first day was just like, wow. Yeah, right. Yeah. And that... Then, did, like, with that trial, did you say to him, hey, if you do this again... Yeah, know. that's exactly what I said to him. I said to him, hey, if you ever do this again with someone that has experienced true combat... And, and I'm not taking away from the people that have PSD from, uh, like, whatever scenario you want to come with or they have a, a thought of being beaten or, uh, you know, PSD from, mm. from certain things. I just said, look, if you have this again with someone who has had true combat... And you want to go that deep into that gunfight, you need to isolate them. Mm. You need to have them in a safe space because if it was anyone else, like I could have been downstairs just like going nuts mm. and not killing, just super alpha male, super aggressive towards people. Or I could have been very sexual and done something I shouldn't have. You know what I mean? Like it was mm. just crazy. Yeah, right. Yeah, nuts. It was crazy. Oh, yeah. Right. And then, so you have that and then... Another major incident in, in that year, your wife got really, really sick. Yeah, so again, a luxury of being in the regiment. So I was, um, so <laughs> actually, let's go back. Let's go back to 2017, the 4th of February. So I was the section commander. So I'd finally got my section uh, as the 3-1 within Delta Company and been at work for three days. Uh, and I'm still the section commander 
and we had to go and do a um, uh, what do you call those checks on people, like a courtesy check for welfare uh, check. Welfare yeah. check. Yeah. We had yeah. to do a welfare check. So Pete Cave, we're talking about now. So me and uh, another mate, um, and being a senior, hey, you need to go and do this welfare check and check on Pete because Pete was, you know, uh, uh, the op sergeant. So he taken my job as the op sergeant of Delta Company. So we go around. Uh, uh, CSM's like, hey, you got to go and do a welfare check. Something's up with Pete. And I'm like, oh, okay, no drama. So we get to his house. His car's there. Uh, I know him and I know his wife at the time, Gwen. And uh, I knock on the door. No, nothing. I jump the fence. I go around. I said, look, there's all this stuff inside. It's all neat and tidy. I uh, So I ring her and I said, hey, look, um, is Pete home? And she goes, is his car there? And I said, yeah, his car's here. And she goes, well, if his car's there, he's there. He doesn't go anywhere without his car. I said, righto. I said, well, look, um, I've tried to get in the house. I've knocked on the door. I've got no answer. Um, is there any way I can get into the, the house? And she goes, look, there's a little uh, key lock on the side of the house. I'll give you the code. That'll be the front door key. I said, righto. So she did that. And then I said, where are you? I didn't even ask her where she was because uh, I didn't actually know the scenario of what had happened. Mm. And I didn't really want to know. I just wanted to see if Pete was okay. But whilst I was around the back, I noticed all his military bags were all lined up, stacked up super neat and the house was sort of like and i'm like okay this is a military house and it's super neat and he's just got stuff in the lounge room because it's a small house mm. uh his car's outside so his garage is probably full of army gear so that's my and there was a rope on the um actual top of the bags and it was tied up real neat and tidy i'm like oh okay like so if i thought that he was going to do self-harm you'd think he would use the rope and I'm like, well, the rope's there it's tied up i'm yeah no dramas let's just go in but before we went in my mate was there and being tactically savvy i would like to think we come up with a course of action where hey i'll go in first you stay two meters behind me that way if he charges at us or something's happened you can react and then you can either assist or you can run mm, yeah. <laughs> you know because if he's got a shotgun yeah you know like but i took that risk of i'll go first i'll call his name i'll enter each room i'll call his name i'll enter each you know just yeah. really yeah, yeah, and yeah. then so really going through methodically checking anyway so we walked in the kitchen the kitchen's all packed up there's a little whiteboard with all these notes on it and in hindsight like if you wanted to stop and check they were all death notes and i hate you notes and you know they weren't very nice notes to his family members anyway so I, that is what it is um i go around i check the toilet uh, there's nothing in the lounge room. There's nothing anywhere. Other than he- heaps nice. I check the toilet. There's a bit of pee on the seat, and there's the urine still in the si- thing. Oh, and the, he hasn't flushed the toilet. And I'm like, so I look up the stairs. Nothing there. And then there's a door there, which is the garage. I open the garage, and it's black. And on the the, gr- the garage, there is a treadmill. And on the treadmill, there's a picture. I don't look at the picture. I'm not looking for the picture. I'm looking for Pete. And there's a candle burning. I don't even doesn't register that there's a candle burning with a picture of his whole family that which is what it ended up being mm. and i look in there and i'm like yeah 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 nothing 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 i look over there nothing and as i close the door i look harder and you can just see him he was just hanging so he was just hanging by a rope uh and i'm like i got him bj well that's my mate i got him i got him get a knife and like um you know cut him down and and then i uh, um end up sucking face with him you know he'd already coagulated or whatever you want to call that mm. around his neck so he was gone um, but he'd only just freshly pissed his pants so i didn't know if if there was room to get the blood flow going back so i just started doing my thing and then um, i got bj to call triple zero uh, and while he's calling triple zero i'm cpring banging him on the chest but i had time to get my phone out i'm doing my count my 30 count mm. and i'm dialing the company sergeant major so i've got the company sergeant major on um loudspeaker bring 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 and i'm one like i'm pushing doing my, my 30 count yeah, with yeah, two yeah. breaths 30 count whatever and he goes yeah i said oh, i got him mate yeah yeah uh we've called the coppers uh i've cut him down and he's like, i'm on my way i'm on my way so it was just insane so then the coppers come and i'm just sucking face with pete cigarette smell taste oh it's just like horrendous yeah. you know and i gotta live with this but no, no you might as well tell the listeners yeah. exactly the journey of that uh and then um yeah i'm sucking face with him the paramedics come in yeah he's gone bro but you did everything you could you did exactly the right thing just keep going until we get here and let us do our bit yeah. um and then bj was obviously outside the company sergeant major rocked up the police rocked up 
<laughs> it's quite funny. The first pair of coppers, because they're working in pairs, come in, notebook, pen, yep, details, this, that, and the rest, and you get no dramas. Second set of coppers come in, different set, notebook and pen, details, boom, okay, yep, I'll entertain this. This is all right. Oh, you know, it's methodical. It's mm. good to go. Uh, and then they all know now where we work and who we are. Third set of coppers come in. No, no notebook, no pen, start asking the questions. And I said, bro, are you fucking shitting me? I said, you walk in here, no pen, no notebook, and ask the same questions and don't take down the details. I said, get the fuck out of my face. I said, you just want to come and talk. Mm. And he's looking at me. I've just been sucking face with a dead dude, bro. Get the fuck out of my face. If you're not going to be professional enough, I don't want to know about it. And he just puts his head down and walks out. Now, yes, okay, in hindsight, I shouldn't have done that. But I was just frustrated. You're the third pair of coppers to come up to me and you don't even have the audacity to get your notebook and pen out and take down details. And you're yeah. you just asking the questions because that's what your job is. Yeah. Like, no, mate, see you later. So I, and I was, I was sitting there wearing a Ralph Lauren shirt, a nice pair of shorts and a, and a pair of pluggers <laughs> sweating me ass off. <laughs> and I've just sucked face with one of my mates from work. Like, you know, like, yeah. And, and that's pretty raw detail that I've just given you. Anyway, two days later, um, I go, so I go back to work and the RSM and everyone's just like, obviously devastated and like, well, man, like they actually made me one of the regiment first responders then just because of the process and how I did it. Mm. I'm like, yeah, I, I'll do that. I mean, how, how worse, how much worse can it be mm. that that's happening? Is my daughter there or? Uh, no, 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 no. no. Anyway, so, um, yeah. So two days later, I'm back in the ops chair. So I'm now just suck face with this dude. I'm now sitting in his chair doing his job plus my job. So I'm now the op sergeant and I'm now the, uh, the section commander. Oh, far out. So I'm now doing double dipping on that job. And then it was actually 2017 that my wife got sick. Oh, it's, sorry. 20- so this is all happening now. I'm now sitting in that chair. I've now, and then we had this massive... Uh, exercise going on and I was so keen for this like to get on the tools again and then to change lanes and then to validate yourself back in the platoons with a, a fresh and I was we were so prepped and ready to go and then um my missus uh, had gone through a certain stage and you know the first event we'll call it happened in the car and she thought the car was rolling and she's like what are you doing the car and I'm like we were just turning a corner but she thought the whole car was flipping on its head and like, God. she like never ever came. And I'm like, what the, f- what is wrong? Are you okay? Oh yeah, just my head was spinning. And it, so it happened once. And then about a month later, it happened again. And then two weeks later, it happened again. Then one week later, it happened. And then three days later, and they just become shorter. And it ended up being where three times a day, she'd fall over. And we've got children. So I go to work and I said, look, I don't know what's going on. My wife's had brain scans and this, that and the rest and work have gone, just go. Just go and look after your family. After everything that's happened, obviously Pete, my charge. Um, and only really one officer asked the question, has anyone asked Berger if he's okay? And he didn't know that I'd heard him say it. Um, and he used to be one of the diggers in the regiment and he ended up being my platoon commander in Iraq so he knows who he is um but he actually asked the question welfare wise hey he's been through a lot is is he okay and I wasn't I what you know my wife yes no dramas that just was like the final straw Mm. of and so I spent nine months and we went to that many cardiologists that many brain scans and like so she had what they called was um Oh, something vestibular or vestibular migraines, which is you get the worst severe migraine uh, effects mm. without feeling the pain. Yeah, right. So she just couldn't stand up and she was just boom, over. So, yeah, she, she had that and, like, it was nuts. It was, like, you wouldn't wish it on your worst enemy. Three three times a day, she'd boom, she'd be falling over, done. Oh, and then, right. yeah, yeah. That's, so it just, it's weird how it all went down. And then she became good again once we sorted it and got some medications and, you know, got her on track and diet. I, it could have been stress of just everything that had been happening for the years as well. Mm. Like, mm. you know, she could have been um, carrying all my stress. You know what I mean? Because, yeah. I, you know, like with the charge and the sexual, everything. 
So that's how that happened. And then, yeah, then 2018 obviously was supposed to be posted and uh, declined getting promoted. Um, you know what I mean? I just, it just, for me, it was the best thing I could do, regardless of being promoted to sergeant, which I'd worked so hard to get to. Mm. Took me, what, 14 years? 06. So what's that? 06, I was promoted to Lance Corporal. Mm hmm. End of 06, I was promoted to Corporal, December 8th, and I discharged October 31st, 2019, as a Corporal. So what's that, 13, 14 years? 14 years, yeah. 14 years. That's, yeah, and as you say, if that incident never happened, you, yeah. You oh, would. but, you know, and yes, in hindsight, uh, you know, I could have been still in the regiment now because once you get to an administrative role, um, but in saying that, that the fall would have dictated a lot of that anyway. Mm. You know, and that's probably what made me be so rude to the officer in the first place. So I want to talk about that. You, you transition like after, so as you say, 20 years and three days. Mm. That's all you'd known. How was that transition, mate? Um. You should ask my wife that question. She'd probably give you a better answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, at first I felt so free because of the bureaucracy of the job and really starting to understand the po politics of it and understand, you know, the more you're in something, the more you understand something, you know, like you don't want to be naive. You know, I was fighting for years for the officers to spend more time in as a platoon commanders because, you know, they really get to understand the role and the job and the responsibilities and then understand, you know, going forward that they could develop themselves a lot better. Um, I fought for that for many years. So to be honest, leaving the military uh, in that fashion, knowing that I'd done all my DVA stuff and knowing that I had um, gone through all the processes to understand my brain, my body, uh, I really... I left and I had my motorbike helmet on. Uh, when I left, I screamed, I'm free. And I deafened myself. And I'm like, oh shit, yeah, you got a bike helmet on, dickhead. Like, so, and I, I honestly felt, especially for the 18 months of just being in limbo at the end of it, mm. um, but the regiment really looked after me. And, and by that I mean, they allowed me to go through the process of desensitizing myself to being on the tools, to being an alpha male to even being uh, in that thought process of, you know, being at that high level. And it was actually probably the best thing. Um, and I could, if I could recommend to anyone and, and an organization that has someone that spends so much time, give them the space to find their own way uh, and, you know, save a life, to be honest. Like, that's what we're doing. We're trying to look after veterans and, you know, we're just different breeds. We look at life differently. Mm. We see things uh, differently. We, we, you know, and I'm not saying we see it better. We just see it differently, mm. you know, because we've been institutionalized for so long. Oh, 20 years. We, we, you, yeah, but more than that, because you go from school yeah. where you're dictated to that this is the rules and this is what you'll do to going into the military where you're dictated to, you're fed three square meals a day, mm. you get out of the military, you've got to fend for yourself. Some people don't know how to tie their shoes. Think of it like that. Yeah. That yeah, these yeah. people don't know how to tie their shoes, even though they've been given every um, part of everything, like three square meals a day. They're so good at what they do. They this, But then they're lost. Mm. The journey is like, well, who am I? What am I doing? This person doesn't understand me. I don't understand them. They... Like I find civilians not for any other reason to be very narrow in their thought process because if you look at society these days, the world is going so fast because of technology mm. that no one has the time to stop and see and be conscious in any moment. They're just like, yeah, this needs to happen, so let's do that. I need to f put food on the table. And to be honest, that's what the money wants that's what the the people that run the world want they want everybody to be that busy that they don't have the time to stop and smell the roses mm. because that complicates the money's life it's a great analogy of how we are at the current where we're at and yeah it, it is and, and i can see mate why you know getting out of being like you say it's 
institutionalized from school to military i can see why a lot of veterans struggle mate and, yeah you know and and that transition is hard and for you well how many of them are still married you know what i mean like my biggest thing of remaining conscious in every moment moment sorry is understanding that my wife is an individual and she has her own thoughts and I respect her for that. Like I don't, ex like military men and women are so robust in this is how it's got to be done and they want structure. But that's not how, like if you, if you don't respect, like she did, tw she's done 23 years with me now and 18 of that was in the military. You know what I mean? Like, and the fact that she's like, okay, not just her, but we as a couple have spent the last four and a half years nearly every day together is testament to adapting because if I was in the military, I'm away for nine months of the year mm. and she's got a routine. I come home, it's happy family. It's, it's seen them every, you know what I mean? Weekend or even though you see them every night, mm. it might be for an hour. Not not you know, every day. Not every day and picking them up from school and making their lunches. I mean, I get up now and my wife sleeps in and I make all my kids lunches and you know, and I, I, I try, or, you know, sometimes I'm not very good at it, but I definitely try to uh, engage. My, my hardest thing that I'm conscious of leaving Defence Force is I just can't be fucked. I just, it, it's easier, it's, to be honest, it would be easier for me to be single and just be me. Yeah. You know, but that's not how my life's going. Mm. I've got a family who I love. And I need to make that work mm. because I want to. Absolutely. Yeah. And so you move, so separate from defense and you move up to where we are. We're in your beautiful home up in the Hunter Valley. Yep. And what are you doing now, mate? What's, what's happening now and, and you going forward into the future? Uh, so it took me a little bit. Um, I really want my wife to succeed in what she wants to do. So I'm happy to take that back seat, but... That's a slow process, and now that we have a one-year-old, it's even a slower process. So I started a company in COVID, which was Hardcore Hunter Fitness, uh, and then I sat on that and just trained my neighbours really free of charge because, you know, we can't go anywhere and do anything. I'm not going to charge people. Mm. You know, I just want to try and keep their morale and their s social aspects up. So then I thought, no, that's not broad enough for myself and what I really think that I can affect. So then I um, created Hardcore Human Performance. So I want to embrace the physical, the mental, the life coaching. So it works on uh, business mindset methodologies, uh, leadership, um, and really putting into practice all the lessons that I've learned and I've learned a lot of lessons through you know my own poor behavior um, and I'm the very first to admit that but why not let people learn you know discipline and a constructive way of providing so with with that you know like um I do business, like I said, business mindset methodology, critical business analysis, people in business, structure. Um, and all they've got to do is like, say, if they engage with hardcore human performance, you know, we do a consult, which is free, and then we come up with a plan. And then from there, we, we start our journey, which is quite funny because um, I've got a lot of, from another podcast I did with Maddie Morris, um, I've had a lot of young males reach out to me about joining the special forces so at the moment i'm talking to maybe six young blokes who are even struggling to get into the military and just coming up with ideas and um method methods of resilience and whilst you wait you build your capacity to maximize your learning uh, test yourself so you know i try and work i've been trying to get in with the newcastle knights forever you know i'll probably send my my last email to them tomorrow articulating my passion to make them a worldwide uh, performer in elite sport um, and I say that not flippantly um, but a lot of these organizations and sporting teams are very professional 
but they're not elite in nature. Mm. And um, elite mindset is is hard to come by. And there are players. Look at the Cleary. Um, there's a couple of you look at uh, some of the guys that have been around for a while. Tyson Frizzell. Their will to want, and their will to want to be the best, means that they don't rest on their laurels, and just rock up the training and do what is expected of you. Mm. You stay or you get there early and you develop the elite mindset that no one can match. Well, I watched a similar thing the other day with Cam Smith. Yeah. And it was something that Craig Bellamy saw in him in his early years and he even said it. He goes, I was going through the motions and Craig said, well, if you want to be, if you, there's more in you. If you want to be great, you got to do these little one percenters and look at him like he, yeah. he's going to be a future immortal. Like yeah. you know, and played over four hundred games and like you're, that's what you're saying. You're doing the one percenters yeah. that the the good players don't, and that's how the 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 good players become the great players, and then the great players become the elite. Yeah, and but you want to try and make them elite at such a young age, mm. so you they can then develop and produce the people around them grow. Mm. So like if you're elite and you, you're around an organisation or, you know, you always, like, you know, when you say if you play a football team and they're, like, um, the worst players ever, you play to their level. Mm. You go to their level. So if you're elite and you go to work and you act elite and you think elite and you, you do more because more is more or you, you know, you stay the extra hour and, and everyone goes, oh, I'm feeling a bit guilty because he's been here every day this week doing it, I'm going to go out and do something. And then you just build mm. better mindsets and their will to want. Like, why is he doing that? Mm. He's the best player we've got. Why is he out there? That's why he's the best player. But it because, it, you know, they get the money, they rock up the training, they think they're killing it. Like, more is more. Mm. Like, I'm tr- trying well, to change. from the regiment, mate. Like, what you... And it's... The daily renewable contracts, mate. Doesn't yeah. matter how good you were yesterday. Today is a new day. You've you've got to be, you got to be the best today. Like you yeah. got to be the best version of you. And you and I get and I can see your passion about it, mate. I can see mm. I'm sitting across. I can see how passionate you are about it. And it's great to see. Like, yeah, you know. And I just need the opportunity, and I just want the opportunity to affect a space. Mm. I, I want the opportunity to say, hey, like, don't let me go to waste i am offering my myself to you mm. i am not just going to tell you or give you what i think you need i am that professional and that understanding that you tell me what you need and i work to that mm. i'm that flexible in the space because that's the art of adaption if i can adapt i can be flexible mm. i can then change lanes yeah and that's my that's awesome so Hopefully the Knights get back to you, mate. So he's hoping. But I'm sure there'll be someone out there that will, you know. If I have to travel for it, so be it. Yeah. Um, but being a junior in Newcastle Knight, that's what I was hoping for. Um, you know, and everyone goes, why didn't you just start at a junior team? I'm like, well, if you aim aim for the top, you know what I mean? Yeah. You're not going to miss by much. No, that's right. If you miss. That's right. Exactly. You know, and if I fail, how did I fail? Um, and I know how I'm failing at the moment in a lot of uh, of the professional aspects is I'm just not putting myself out there. Mm. And it's not through fear of failure. It's like once I commit, my family may suffer because I'm just going to be 100% because I'm going to enjoy myself way so just way too much. Yeah. And I'm going to be, yeah, yeah, I'm doing this. Oh, we're doing this. And I can if I can see the change in these, say, professional athletes mm. – and watch them become elite humans, not just elite athletes, elite humans, changing their mindsets, changing the way that they apply themselves to the task, not just rock up, oh, I've got training today. Or like talking to one of my NRL mates, he goes, oh, I've got to go to work. Like, it's not work, mate. You're playing a game. Yeah, okay, you're getting paid for it, all right? But you're going, like, don't just, it's not just work because then it becomes a goofy loop. Oh, I've got to go to work. I've got to, I've got to train, mate. How awesome would it be to get paid? To play a game you love. But, and this is what I try and tell some of the people that I talk to, how old, like, how old are you? Or oh, let's say I'm 27. How long have you got left to play at that level of professional sport? What do you want to do after? What lessons have you learned that you can apply 
to the to the real world. To the not only to the real world. What if you love the sport that much? What can you give back? How do you give back? Mm. Like develop the structure that makes you an asset, regardless of age, to any organization. It's a good way. It's a great more. It's a great way to think. Mate. Yeah, because a lot of people don't do that. No, you know, they're just in the moment. They're just oh yeah. I'm a which is which goes back to the analogy of technology controlling the speed in which we, you know, my friend sent me a message the other day uh, for his birthday. He goes, "Don't don't not talk to me trying to make me feel bad because it took me ages to send you the message." I was just driving. It was like half an hour. Yeah. It's like just give me a minute, <laughs> give me a second, mate. I might have something else going on. Yeah, like don't that. let don't let the technology dictate to you because someone hasn't gotten back to you, mm. or don't send another text. How about you call him? I'm in the car driving, mate. Oh, that's why you haven't texted. Yeah, mate, that is your dickhead. That, that's the reason why. Like, oh, mate, but that's the way of the world, mate. That's what we're. That's how we're. You know, that's how we're living at the moment. And it's because we're not conscious. We're not living consciously. We're, we're just living to. No, well, we're living to survive, mm. which is going through the motions, which is an unconscious, like you said way of living because mm. it's just like uh, it's like you, you you push the button open the door walk through the door yeah okay i did that what yeah you know, there's not even what's next you just know i'm gonna take three paces there's the coffee machine that you know like it's just yeah it's habit it's routine but are they good habits are they good routine that's right or is it exactly what someone wants us to be like so that they can succeed and then we are just the cattle in the yard providing the meat the milk the fur everything Oh mate, that's that, we could talk about that for another. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can. Sorry, another. we've only been here what six hours. Yeah, so. <laughs> six hours. So, mate, we're nearly finished. So, knowing what you know now, what advice would you give to your eighteen-year-old self, and would he listen? <sighs> um, I, as an eighteen-year-old, I was actually really receptive to um, good guidance, as long as it was delivered correctly. Uh, what information would I give myself and would I listen? You're on the right path, just have a go. I didn't grow up uh, super intelligent, but I had very good street smarts and I had a bloody good work ethic. Um, don't drink as much. Alcohol has cost me so much. But it's probably where I've learnt my best lessons. It's good advice, mate. Any young fella out there? <laughs> yeah, any, I know. Any young fella? They're out like, there? ah, fuck off! I'm going to get the piss. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, it. apologies. No, no, take it, take it on. No, definitely, it's it's absolutely, and it's funny because I look at it myself now that I'm in my thirties as well, and I think back very differently to how I was when I was eighteen and where I am now, and right through my mid twenties and. You know, I've got into my 30s and like you say, the drink's actually dropped off a lot because I've kind of worked it out that I don't need it. I don't need it. I don't want it. Very similar to you where you go... Different responsibilities now and, and you, you're accountable for so much more. And yep. if you want more, you have to be conscious and drinking is just like, I'm going to get... You I'm gonna get week. I'm going to get shit fat. Yeah, that's right. I'm gonna you get, lose a week to recover. Yeah, mate. And it's just not worth it. And then you just feel sorry for yourself and, oh, my God. The waste not, of money. Like, yeah, money's yeah. so hard oh, to come by now. Oh, wow. Well, yeah, like... You know, the four or $500 nights, like, that's just... That's yeah. It's half your wage. Mm. Like, you know, so, yeah. Any young player out there, listen listen to what Bergs is saying and, and because he's right. And, you know, it's... He's coming from experience of someone who's been there, done that, and and it's something that I learnt too with my parents trying to help me. They've been there. They 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 know the mistakes. Sometimes you 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 got to make the mistakes to actually yeah. learn a lesson. And well, yeah. what did Will Smith say? Fail hard and fail often, because you need to learn, and failure is the best lesson. Now, I'm not saying fail at life, mm. but if you fail. Make sure it's a good fail. Well, that's where you and then and then learn. Mm. That's what I mean. So you know, Will Smith said that to me. Oh, that resonates with me. Hundred uh, percent. And you know, because sometimes from winning, you don't. There's not a lesson in winning. You you, you know, like you, yeah, you win. There's a winner. There's a loser. Yeah. You you learn more lessons from your losses and your fail and your failings than what you do from if you win all the time. 
Yeah. It's, it's you know, it's a you will trick. succeed, yeah. but you'll get to a level and go, okay, well. This is easy. I yeah, yeah, do yeah, this. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. So, mate, what advice can you give to people who are looking at going to SF and like, and how to mentally prepare and physically prepare? That's funny. I had a conversation with a young bloke um, last couple of days. You know, and, and he's telling me what levels he's at and he's quite happy with it. But I'm like, more is more. Um, if it hurts, keep going. Do not stop. Because the levels of resilience you build enable you to adapt to when shit gets real. Because, um, you know, study, but be passionate about what you want and don't let anyone tell you no. Great advice. Great advice, mate. Looking back now, you served with some amazing guys in the 2nd Command, Commando Regiment and you lost 12 commandos killed in action and one preparing for deployment. How do you remember all these guys? <sighs> and It's funny because I think of them often and with my brain the way it is sometimes I even forget their names and then I've got to, I sit there for hours just hounding myself to remember like the Scotty Palmers you know the Mesos the Ben Chucks you know like Timmy Applin Timmy, yeah. yeah Timmy Applin you know like yeah like the Brett Woods oh, you know, the, the Jason Marks um they gave so much for what they loved and believed in, that they didn't die for nothing. And there is a lot of lessons to be learnt from these individuals. Um, sacrifice, not just to yourself and to the ignorance of being, I don't know, it's hard to explain. I just, I think about how much they've given. And when I'm having a bad day, I just think about that they're not here. And I owe it not only to them, but to their sacrifice, to their families, to do better, to be better. Um, I think of them often. I really, really do. Um, I think of some of their smiles, like the, the Scotty Palmer was just a cheeky, really staunch, um, he was hard, and he wasn't that tall, you know, but he was he was good to go. Um, you know, it, there's so many things. I just want people, you know, we, we live in such a naive, oh, it'll never happen to me world, um, but be careful what you wish for because these people, they're there for you. You know, I went to a Remembrance Day last year and I asked the teacher, why isn't anyone here? And he goes to me, oh, we don't want to glorify war. Like, we're at Remembrance Day, remembering the sacrifices of the Australians all the way back to World War I. are on the walls, mate. Yeah. All the way back to World War I. Oh, even before that, the Boer War. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Where they gave their life so that we could live free. And the the thing that annoys me the most, and I know I've gone off track here a little bit, no, is, no, is that, you know, we're dictated to by politicians that don't live real world. They live with their blinkers on and think that they're doing just by who? They don't know their own Australian people. You know, and these Australians that have given their life thinking that we've sacrificed so much... For the veterans that have come home that are lost because they don't know how to fit into society and although there's a few people out there really trying to fight for this, it needs to be a cultural change on how we treat and respect our veterans, sure. And I'm, say, I'm not saying that because I'm a veteran, but because of their sacrifice and the lessons we can learn by just enabling them to to give their experiences and how they transfer to real life. Mm. You know, the Brett Woods, you know, the greatest human I have ever known. 
and I don't say that lightly because I know a lot of really, really good humans. Um, and all he wanted to do was do the job. And he would have died with a smile on his face. I oh, know, and it's funny, I've listened to a lot of podcasts where people have actually been part of his last moments. And all I want to do is, is thank them. And, and they're my brothers. They were there. Mm. It, yeah, it blows my mind. It's, I think it's something that when I had slats on, he said, I serve with some amazing men and women in their special it's an honour to have served with alongside them and I think you're right mate uh, you have have served alongside some pretty amazing individuals and to wear that 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 green beret mate you're part of a brother and a sisterhood that is just it, it's so special and yeah. you've just hit the nail on the head like yeah, that's and that's what remembrance is. We should, you know, there's people. That's why I do the podcast, mate. It's be, to get your stories out there. To it's our history. We should be proud of our history. Yeah, we should be proud of it, mate. We, we there's. I mean, we could yeah, we could definitely talk about that, that closing uh, statement. It's taking us a while to get through. <laughs> yeah, yeah, mate. Honestly, it, but it's mate. It is definitely. Yeah, these are real issues that, that, you know, the questions need to be asked. And, mate, we could talk for another four hours on that. But, but Craig, looking back now, with 20 years and three days serving your country, was joining the Army still the best decision you made? Yes and no. It's a catch-22. I am very, very grateful um, for doing the job, but the aftermath of service to your country, it takes its toll. So I've learned some great lessons and I, that's why I'm trying to uh, pass those lessons on to anyone that wants to be a better version of themselves um, and hopefully not at the cost that it's cost me in, you know, my 44 year old body that feels 84 and you know to my brain damage um to my three surgeries thus far this year with another one to come but yes and no um I wouldn't be the human I am with the uh hopefully lessons learnt that I have and the knowledge and wisdom I would like it's quite funny me saying that I'm wise but I, I do believe that I have some wisdom to pass on from a life lived, but it's a hard life that I now have to complete without my military brethren. Mm, absolutely. And, mate, it's been an absolute epic ride and I'm just so grateful that I've been able to sit down with you and, and record your story and give you the the time and, and the the respect that you are due for what you've done for our country. And, mate, how do people get in contact with you? Um, hardcore Human Performance uh, through LinkedIn, which is uh, just my name, Craig Hamburger. Um, uh, Instagram, Hardcore Human Performance. Again, I've really just tried to push the name out there. It's quite funny coming from such an organisation where you don't tell people who you are and what you do. I had to change my alias on Facebook to become my real name um, and that was actually hard to do, um, which people would laugh at. Like, But, you know, to become present and out of the shadows. Uh, yeah, hardcore human performance. I am looking to start another company in the very near future um, which will incorporate hardcore human performance as a... Um, offshoot um but i'm really just watching this space to to get out there in youtube um mentoring motivating and building better humans mate as i say it's been an absolute honor and a privilege to 
sit down and share your story. Craig, you've served your country with honour and brought pride to your family. Your story is one of true grit, determination, having the courage to be to be brave and test yourself and succeed at the elite level. There's a quote, mate, that I want to finish with that I believe sums you up. And it goes, here's the quote. Warriors are not the ones who always win, but the ones that always fight. The only reason a warrior is alive is to fight, and the only reason that a warrior fights is to win. Craig, I believe this sums you up, and I want to thank you once again for what you have done for our, for our country and for all that you do for veterans, first responders, and it's been an absolute honour and a privilege to have you on True Blue Conversations and share your story. So thank you, mate. It's been an absolute honour. Thank you. Um, just in closing, uh, thank you to anybody that has already reached out and continues to reach out. Um, let's just be better humans, and thank you. Thanks, brother. Welcome, loyal listeners of True Blue Conversations. Today's episode is proudly sponsored by Australian Warfighter Coffee. Veteran owned and run, driven by a simple yet powerful motto, people over profit. Every dollar goes towards supporting veterans and first responder charity groups. Head on over to australianwarfighters.com and use the code TRUEBLUE for your exclusive discount. Because let's face it, any other coffee is just just brown brown sadness water. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of True Blue Conversations with your host, Adam Bloom. See you on the front line.